I mean, it's inconceivable for any Western democracy to subsist even for 10 years more if we didn't have, through progressive taxation, a steady transfer of resources from rich people to poor. Well, I consider that we can begin to talk about the world environment and about safeguarding our planet when we, the rich nations, are giving in perfectly formal, institutionalized tax assistance. Oh, at least 1% of our gross national product in development capital for the poorer nations, I would go higher myself. You see. We've got to stop lecturing them while we sit back and in gross, 80% of the world's income for 20% of the world's people. And that, I think, is the critical thing on this development environment issue. you see from the moon. A single, alone, full of light, full of light, and the only single planet that's got these qualities, that that vision, especially among the young, can mean a redirection of how people think about this problem. Because you will not create a community unless you've got some moral commitment. And moral commitment needs some very stern underpinnings, because we ain't moral easy. in this ceremony, which has honored three distinguished citizens of the free world, President Pusey, Father Bunn, and our friend from the world of freedom, Lady Jackson. is the shortage of capital, so obstructed are the means of development that they won't even be able to learn from our mistakes. That, is the, that would the be danger. the ultimate tragedy. I mean, for us to go and make the mistakes and then no one to learn from them, that really would be a cosmic bad joke. I am Andrew Norton. I've been director for only just over a year of the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Barbara Wood Lecture for 2016. The Barbara Wood Lecture Series celebrates the founder of IIED, Barbara Wood. She was a renowned economist, journalist, and policy advisor who was among the earliest advocates of sustainable development she was also, by all accounts, an amazing public speaker. No pressure, Deborah. 
In honor of Barbara Wood's pioneering work, IIED invites members of the current generation of outstanding women leaders in sustainable development to present their thoughts on the pressing issues of the time. The lectures take place every two years and speakers in the past have been former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, Connie Hedegaard, you will have seen many, you will have seen all of them on, on the screen, European Commissioner for Climate Action, South African MP Lindue Sisulu, Christiana Figueres, the former Executive Sec uh, Secretary of the UN, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and Fatima Denton, Director of the Special Initiatives Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. This year, in 2016, it's 10 years since the first lecture took place. Barbara Ward was a pioneering economist, writer, and lecturer, and she was, of course, one of the first people to articulate the concept of sustainable development and what was needed to underpin it. And her vision still inspires IID's work today. Barbara Ward was born on the 23rd of May, 1914. After graduating from Oxford University, she published her first book on a theme which would continue to preoccupy her throughout her life, the growing gap between rich and poor countries. You have seen some powerful quotes on the opening film. In 1939, she joined The Economist uh, magazine, eventually becoming foreign editor. She continued to publish influential books throughout the 50s and 60s and played a major part in highlighting the economic problems of the developing world. And in her later years, Ward was especially concerned about the growth of urban poverty and the conflict between economic development and protecting the environment, themes that we will be looking at today with Deborah. She founded IIED in 1971 as a policy research organization to work in partnership with organizations across Africa, Asia, and Latin America to promote sustainable development. The Institute played a key role in the Stockholm Conference of 1972, the Brundtland Commission of 1987, the Earth Summit of 1992, and the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development, as well as, of course, in the landmark events of 2015. So fresh for us now, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. Environmental campaigners know Barbara Ward perhaps best for her remarkable book published in 1972, Only One Earth, The Care and Maintenance of a Small Planet. And anyone who's not read it, I would recommend that. Um, it's still incredibly kind of sharp and real for the problems we face today. In this, she writes of the need to clearly define what should be done to maintain the Earth as a place suitable for human life, not only now, but also for future generations, which remains perhaps the first and best definition of the concept of sustainable development. So, IIED is delighted to welcome renowned climate scientist, urban practitioner, and local government official, Dr. Deborah Roberts, to be our speaker at the 2016 Barbara Ward Lecture. Deborah has received global recognition for spearheading work on how the world's cities can tackle the risks of climate change, and she is co-chair of Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN body that reviews and assesses scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information on climate change. Deborah is perhaps particularly known for putting the South African city of Durban on the world map as a real frontrunner and leader in climate action in the urban space of all kinds. As head of Durban's Sust Sustainable and Resilient City Initiatives Unit, she is also the municipality's first chief resilience officer, overseeing the city's first climate resilience strategy. Her projects include leading the Durban Adaptation Charter for Local Governments, developed and adopted during the UN climate negotiations in Durban in 2011, which has now been signed by more than 900 cities around the world. And this charter has played a major role in securing broad-based global political commitment at the local government level to strengthen the capacity of cities to deal with the impacts of climate change. She has worked as a lecturer and researcher at the University of Natal, South Africa, and written widely in the fields of urban open space planning, environmental management, and urban climate protection. Some key points about Deborah: That it is really remarkable to have a local government official who is also actively engaged in both um, global intellectual leadership as a scholar and writer, and in global policy, especially through the IPCC and the UNFCCC. 
She works to make global decisions locally relevant and provides a model for how to work in these different domains and bridge the divide between them, which is an essential element for producing effective local action on global agendas such as climate change. This lecture comes as the world focuses on urban issues ahead of the Habitat 3 conference to be held in Quito, Ecuador over the next couple of weeks. The UN's first urbanization conference in 20 years, Habitats come along every 20 years, Habitat 3 will seek global political commitment to making cities more sustainable, inclusive, and as Deborah in particular has championed, resilient to the impacts of climate change. The world's population is now over 50% urban. The urban population is estimated will nearly double by 2050. And one billion people around the world in urban informal settlements lack access to adequate shelter and sanitation. IIED's Human Settlements Group have worked on issues of urban sustainable development for over 20 years. Our work through long-standing local partnerships has provided some key messages. Firstly, that urbanisation offers substantial opportunities to reduce poverty, building on proximity and density of urban areas to provide more practical and uh, cost-effective access to infrastructure and services. Secondly, that local level finance allocated through accountable and transparent processes and blending with households and communities' own resources and savings can enable organised communities to do extraordinary things. Such finance has the potential to scale up informal settlement upgrading, provide vital services, strengthen livelihoods, and demonstrate that there are alternatives to evictions. Thirdly, that cities are at the front line of responding to climate change, both in reducing greenhouse gas emissions to limit global warming, and in taking actions to prevent harmful impacts on people, infrastructure, societies, and economies. There are many co-benefits to be realised here. Sustainable, low-carbon cities should be more equitable, healthier and easier for all citizens to move around. In the run-up to Habitat 3, it is worth noting a couple of things. This is a real opportunity for the stakeholders gathering there, national and local governments, civil society and development actors, development agencies, to develop and implement a new urban agenda that unites and that aligns with the key commitments of 2015, the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Our emphasis should be on the need for different stakeholders beyond just national governments to be part of that conversation. We need a focus on how the new urban agenda commitments will be implemented. And this is frankly a little weak in the document in some ways, as my colleague at IAD, David Satterthwaite, has eloquently um, pointed out on a number of occasions in blogs. There is a lack of focus on local government capacity and accountability, which is central to delivering most SDGs. And at best, the poor are seen as passive recipients. At worst, they and their needs are invisible. For example, if local governments made their own commitments to addressing the SDGs and climate agreements and their implementation was monitored by local populations, greater action and results can be achieved. Deborah's work in Durban, South Africa and the world demonstrates how different stakeholders can be part of the policy conversation and how global commitments can be implemented locally. All that remains for me now is the basic housekeeping, and this is the standard thing. If there is a fire alarm, it's a real one. There are no tests planned, so we all have to leave. Um, on hearing a continuous fire alarm, please follow the fire signs and make your way to the fire assembly point located outside Somerset House on the Victoria Embankment Street underneath Waterloo Bridge. And with that rather prosaic note, let me <laughs> hand over to Deborah. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you.